Dennis McKenna, gosh, almost needs really no introduction. Um, you know, he's asked me to read the short bio in the interest of time, so I'm just going to say that Dennis is Assistant Professor, Center for Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota, and Director of Ethnopharmacology at the Hefter Research Institute. And Dennis, I hope you'll tell us a goodly bit about Hefter and what that is, because Hefter is a very important research organization in the community. Um, you know, dare I say, Dennis is an elder from whom we can learn. He's got a new book, um, uh, uh, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Um, he's uh, spent, um, did I say that wrong? The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Yeah. The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Um, over the decades, he's contributed slow and steady on an enormous um, uh, 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 compendium of, of solid uh, research in the psychedelic area. So I'll turn you over to the very capable hands of Dennis McKenna. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to Neil and everyone else who helped to organize this. I've been, they've been threatening to get me here for some years and finally I ran out of excuses. So I'm very happy to be here. This is a great conference. Uh, I feel a little uncomfortable in some ways because I'm the last act and these are hard acts to follow. So I don't know if this is going to come up to the to the you know is this going to come up to the bar or not? Uh, but anyway, we'll we'll talk about uh, this. Neil was very clear that I shouldn't talk more than half an hour. However, because he made me the last speaker, I figured well, you know, I'll take at least an hour and see what what do you want to do about it, Neil? <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, we could get through this quicker. Um, uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is kind of uh, look at ayahuasca from the uh, historical perspective initially and then talk about uh, the position we find ourselves in now with uh, the sort of uh, ayahuasca is emerging on a global stage and uh, where is that taking us in the future? Where might all this go in the next five, ten 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, and so on. Um, I mean, I'm not going to look that far ahead, probably, but th those are questions, because with this plant and, and this plant complex, I think that we're, you know, we're participants in a co-evolutionary process, and, uh, uh, you know, the plant's time frame and understanding of this is v far different than ours, and I think that's probably one of the reasons about the cognitive dis dissonance that we have. You know, uh, humanity is going through some, you know, sort of rough periods in its relationship with ayahuasca, but it's not gonna go away and it will smooth out over time, you know? I mean, we always have to remember what ayahuasca, you know, never fails to remind me of whenever I take it, which is, you know, you monkeys only think you're running things. <laughs> and, and I think that's true. The, the plants are running things, and they're doing it on their own time, and they're, uh, you know, it, it's a very interesting phenomenon, what's, what's going on with ayahuasca on the global stage right now. Uh, Neil wanted me to mention the Hefter Research Institute, and most of you know about that. That's my other, uh, another affiliation, and we're uh, similar to MAPS in that we support psychedelic research. Uh, MAPS is doing wonderful work and so is the Hefter. We're not as well known or as public. We're not really a grassroots organization like MAPS is, but we're, you know, we, we are uh, in cahoots trying to change the nature of science, the nature of therapy, and, and ultimately some of the regulatory frameworks that we have to labor under. Uh, those are necessary too if we're going to really uh, make a difference. So anyway, I'm going to talk about ayahuasca from a historical uh, perspective here. Uh, I don't have to explain to anyone here uh, what ayahuasca is, I hope, but uh, just in case, as you all know, it's a beverage, it's a psychedelic beverage that's used uh, throughout the Amazon basin, and it's really the linchpin of ethnomedicine or this tradition in Peru that they call vegetalismo. And it's 
unique among South American hallucinogens or hallucinogens anywhere in that it's, it's made from at least two plants, always with two plants, one of which is a vine, Banisteriopsis copy, which is itself called ayahuasca, as well as the beverage, and various admixture plants, but most often Psychotria viridis is the most widely used admixture. And the Psychotria viridis contains dimethyltryptamine, which is the hallucinogen part. That's what gives ayahuasca its visionary kick, if you will. But DMT is inactivated in the body by enzymes in the gut and in the liver known as monoamine oxidases. Well, conveniently enough, the beta-carboline alkaloids in Banisteriopsis happen to be potent inhibitors of that enzyme, so they prevent the breakdown of DMT and allow it to be absorbed in an orally active form. And instead of the 10 or 15 minutes of uh, absolute astonishment that follows when you smoke DMT. Uh, this is four to six hours of a much less intense, but in some ways much more uh, noetic uh, kind of experience in that you can bring noetic content out of it. So with that out of the way, and I'm sure it's redundant and unnecessary, but at least just in case there's some poor soul has wandered into this conference, <laughs> not knowing what ayahuasca is, now you know. And uh, how long have we been in a relationship with ayahuasca? Well, nobody really knows based on archaeological evidence. Uh, there's wild speculation that it goes back at least 5,000 years. We'd like to think it does. We know that humanity in the Amazon basin has had relationships with uh, snuffs, for example, DMT containing snuffs, for at least that long. And it seems likely that uh, the area where the snuffs are used or were used are still used. We know the snuffs go back at least five or 6,000 years. And in that same area, Banisteriopsis grows, but it's not clear that it was used. The, the archaeologist Manolos Torres has suggested that uh, uh, there was a lot of chewing of Banisteriopsis that went on, or that it might have been used that way, and that if the people happened to be taking snuff at the same time, they'd quickly get the memo that these combinations were definitely reinforcing and synergistic. We don't really know. You know, it's a reasonable idea, but we don't really know. The only uh, real even indication of any archaeological evidence is this bowl here and similar bowls that uh, this is called the Quito Bowl, and, and generically these were called Vasos de los Brujos. They were decorated with theriomorphic figures, anthropomorphic figures, you know, snakes and, and animal images. And it has been suggested by the archaeoethnologist uh, Plutarco Naranjo that these were vessels used to prepare ayahuasca or boil up other kinds of psychoactive uh, ingredients. Um, and maybe so, but there's been no chemical analysis of the residues in these bowls. So that's really speculation as well. They probably go back to about 500 BC or 500 before the Christian era, somewhere between then and 500 after the Christian era. I mean, that's the, so no one knows, but it's, it seems likely that ayahuasca has been around um, about that long and nobody can really say beyond that. But when you come into the modern era, uh, there are various ways to talk about the history of ayahuasca. You can do it chronologically, in which case we'd never get through this. We may never get through it anyway, but uh, uh, you can talk about it from different aspects that are important. You can discuss botany uh, to begin with. Who first reported this? When did it come into the sort of modern consciousness? And it did so in the 19th century. And the first person to uh, really report or document the use of an intoxicating beverage was this fellow here, Manuel Villavicencio. He was an Ecuadorian geographer, and he reported on the use of a uh, intoxicating beverage among uh, groups on the Napo, but he didn't publish his work. And the first, uh, you know, even though his report predated the reports of Richard Spruce, Richard Spruce, who was an English botanist and explorer, uh, sorry, 
gets the credit because he reported initially uh, he observed ayahuasca being used among the Guajibo tribe in uh, 1851 and then later in 1858 he observed it being used among the Tucano and an Andean group the Zaparo and uh, it in unlike the other explorers Spruce had the presence of mind to collect specimens and uh, you know you'd think it would be an obvious thing but sometimes it just doesn't occur to these guys so they so he collected specimens and on the basis of those specimens it was originally classified as banisteria copy they, the suffix the species name was copy one of the indigenous names they were applying to it and then that became revised in the 1930s and in a revision of the family the malpighiaceae and it was renamed to banisteriopsis copy which is the name that it now has uh, spruce was the first to really report on uh, ayahuasca and, and bring back specimens and in a sense the other reports the earlier reports are kind of footnotes to history uh, w maybe one of the uh, uh, exceptions to this uh, was that uh, uh, there there was a person who reported on the use of admixtures uh, uh, to ayahuasca in, in no detail, but there was a, another another explorer uh, that that did that. It was left to uh, Richard Evan Schultes, the famous Harvard ethnobotanist who's probably the world's expert on ayahuasca, to eventually sort all this out, which he did in 1957, so quite a leap from the original uh, discoveries. He published a very significant paper which was completely ignored uh, by most people. It was called The Identity of the Malpighiaceous Narcotics of South America, this sort of quaint use of the word narcotic in a you know, any, any psychoactive substance was once characterized as a narcotic. Of course, they're not. But uh, this was a very detailed paper in which he published what was known about the botany of ayahuasca at the time. And the question of admixture plants hadn't even entered the picture at this point. It was all about the ingredients of ayahuasca. And that paper, if you happen to have it, is a treasure trove. There's a lot of discussion of other species in the same family that don't really uh, get into the usual conversations about the botany of ayahuasca. There's still a great deal uh, to be uh, to be uh, sorted out there. Other genera of the Malpighiaceae family are also used to prepare ayahuasca. They've been barely studied. Um, but so he sort of gave, Schultes gave the definitive uh, state of the art of ayahuasca at the time. And then fast forward to 1967, uh, the summer of love in San Francisco. And everyone was so busy uh, celebrating the summer of love that almost no one noticed, but there took place in San Francisco uh, a landmark conference at that time. Uh, the, blue uh, square up there is the cover of the publication The Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs and it was published by the Department of Health and Human Service Health and Welfare at the time is what it was called Your Tax Dollars at Work uh, and it was a conference yeah one of the better uses of your tax dollars <laughs> It was a conference where all the luminaries in this area came together and, and tried to puzzle out what was going on, not only with ayahuasca, but all these other South American hallucinogens that were getting, getting, uh, getting attention. And uh, you can actually download, thanks to uh, Earth and Fire, they have the entire uh, volume of the ethnopharmacologic search uh, on their website. You can download and look at it. It's very interesting from a historical point of view because it's how little we knew at that point, and this was 1967. It's really interesting to read some of the discussions after the presentations. Nobody had a clue how ayahuasca worked.
Uh, there was no mention of admixtures at the time. There was, Psychotria was men, is mentioned once in the entire book because I, and Schultes just made an offhand remark, one of my graduate students collected Psychotria. Nothing was known of, of the chemistry at that time. It was only a couple years later after Schultes' graduate student uh, uh, Homer Pinkley and Ara Dermardorosian collected uh, samples of Psychotria viridis and Diploteris cabarena, shown at the bottom. Both admixture plants were used uh, by uh, the COFAN, and it was, and Ara Dermardorosian was a chemist, and he isolated dimethyltryptamine, or detected dimethyltryptamine in both of these, and because they knew of this problem with the uh, oral inactivity of DMT and they knew that beta carbolines were MAO inhibitors that all sort of clarified the picture um, at that point. Uh, but there's much more to be learned about the botany of ayahuasca and the associated plants. In 1986, Eduardo Luna and I uh, worked on what amounted to just a big literature search on other admixture plants uh, to ayahuasca, of which there's uh, somewhat in the neighborhood of 100. We reviewed uh, what was known at the time on about uh, 52 of them with reported uses either as additives to ayahuasca or used in the context of the dietas. And uh, of those 52 genera, uh, about 23% of them are purported to be hallucinogens in their own right. In other words, they're sometimes used with ayahuasca and sometimes alone as psychoactive preparations. And uh, very little is known on the chemistry of these things. So uh, there's a couple PhDs there for anybody who's interested. There's probably a lifetime of work just sorting out this admixture plant technology, not to mention the pharmacology side of it and how that affects, uh, uh, you know, how do these plants alter the pharmacology of ayahuasca and why are they used and, you know, there, there's a lot of work still to be done on this, you know, sort of very well characterized uh, plant complex now. So if we move from, from botany to chemistry, these things are complementary. Uh, and uh, we actually have to go a couple of decades earlier than the discovery or the reporting of ayahuasca. We have to talk about the 1840s, 1841, these German chemists, uh, Heinrich Goebel, Goebel and uh, Johann Fritsch. It's always impossible to pronounce, right? Uh, but they were working on Piganum harmala, which is the Syrian rue, a completely unrelated plant to ayahuasca in a completely different part of the world. But they isolated harmine, anish, harmaline, at first, and then several years later, they isolated harmine from the seeds. That's why these alkaloids have those names. They're named after Piganum harmala, not after ayahuasca. But then if you, again, 60 years later, people started making extracts of what was purported to be Banisteriopsis. These people almost never had any botanical voucher specimens. So for the first you know, couple of decades, all the work was basically a waste of time because they didn't have voucher specimens. They isolated compounds, which they called variously telepathine and yahine and, and banisterine and so on. Uh, one of them even went so far as to assert that the uh, source plant for their yahine isolate was uh, Prestonia amazonica completely unrelated to ayahuasca in, in a different family. And again, undocumented by botanical voucher specimens at all. Uh, interestingly, that rumor, that mis misidentification essentially, persisted in the literature for years, I mean decades, and eventually in the 60s, Schultes had to step in and publish a paper called Prestonia Amazonica, Amazonian hallucinogen or not. Well, it turns out not, you know, and still, so that it's, it's an object lesson of how mistakes can, can persist in science if you don't document your source plants, and this is something that chemists had to learn. Well, eventually, 
they did start working from vouchered material. And Lewis Lewin, who is famous for writing the book Fantastica, uh, okay, well, <laughs> I'll work on it, uh, uh, isolated benisterine, named it benisterine, and Merck chemists confirmed that that was harmine. And so then in the 50s, Hochstein and Paradies did a much thorough analysis with better equipment and, and showed that there was harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine in ayahuasca. And we now know that those are the three major alkaloids. Interestingly, uh, Lewin gave harmine to his friend Kurt Berenger. Both of these folks had worked on the peyote cactus and said, you know, give it a try in some patients. So he tried it out on some uh, Parkinson's patients, a group of 17 Parkinson's patients, and uh, it showed remarkably uh, positive effects in terms of controlling their tremor disorders. So that was the first time that, uh, that a uh, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor had been applied to that. It wasn't known at the time that it was. So we're all, so where people were working on ayahuasca and the chemistry of ayahuasca, DMT was coming along on a parallel tract. Originally, uh, the Canadian chemist RHF Mansk, Mansky, who is well known for his 20 volume work on the alkaloids, isolated a series of tryptamine derivatives to work on, he was working on the constituents of the strawberry shrub. He isolated a series of tryptamines uh, to use as chemical standards. One of them was DMT. It was unknown from nature at that time, and its psychoactive properties were unknown. So he isolated, or he synthesized it, used it for his chromatographic work, put it on a shelf, and forgot about it. Uh, then a Brazilian chemist came along a few years later and isolated a compound called nigerine from Mimosa hostilis which was the source of Uremo, a psychoactive beverage used in eastern Brazil. He isolated a compound called nigerine, and that turned out much later, it was shown that that was the same as DMT. Uh, in the late 50s, uh, Johnson, Fish, Johnson, and Horning isolated DMT from Anadonanthra peregrina, called per, uh, uh, yeah, and in Dana P Piptidania peregrina at the time, but now that name has been changed. Isolated DMT, speculated that that was probably the active principle, but was, were not able to, uh, you know, to develop it. So that kind of is the, uh, you know, that's where uh, DMT was. Uh, and then eventually chemistry and pharmacology came together. And it came together in a sort of an unlikely way because Bill Burroughs, William Burroughs, set out in 1950 to find ayahuasca. Uh, he was the first ayahuasca tourist. And uh, he also had remarkable, he was remarkably ahead of his time because he had an insight that Possibly he called it the final fix, and he was addicted to heroin, as most of you know. And he thought ayahuasca might be a way for him to get off heroin. So he was kind of a pioneer in that way. Uh, in 1956, another uh, pioneer, the uh, Hungarian chemist, uh, Stephen Zara, who was working at NIH at the time, uh, decided to try DMT by injecting it into himself. And that was the first time that he discovered the, the uncon, uncontested psychoactive properties of, of DMT. <laughs> no doubt about it, it worked. And he wrote about this. And eventually he became head of the uh, uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse, which I thought was kind of fitting. Uh, in 1961, Julius Axelrod, who was a neuropharmacologist, uh, won a Nobel Prize later for his work on neurotransmission, isolated enzymes uh, from rabbit lungs that would, would uh, synthesize DMT from tryptophan in, in vitro, in, in tissue homogenate. So he demonstrated that DMT could be endogenously produced. And then decades, about a decade later, he and uh, Saavedra isolated uh, DMT and some other derivatives from the human brain. Um, 
and eventually I ended up working for his protege, Saavedra. That's what attracted me to go work with him. As it turned out, we worked on something completely different, but it was fun to work in that lab. Uh, Jeremy Bigwood, who may be known to some of you, uh, kind of an underground figure in psychedelic world, but a, a pioneer, uh, uh, was the first person to actually confirm that combinations of harmine and synthetic DMT were in fact orally active. But he never published this, and so he is a, he is a footnote. I, wrote him recently and he said, I'm fine being a footnote. I have no problem with that. Um, I was working on my thesis, my uh, PhD thesis at that time became a, a project to investigate the chemistry and the pharmacology of ayahuasca. So my paper, Monoamine Oxidase Inhibitors in South American Hallucinogenic Plants, was the first sort of quantitative uh, look at the MAO activity of ayahuasca and the constituents of some of these admixture plants. In 1993, uh, we undertook uh, a biomedical study at the invitation of the Uniao de Vegetal, one of these syncretic Brazilian churches that used ayahuasca as a sacrament. They were invited myself and a number of investigators, notably Dr. Charles Grobe, who was the head of the project, to go in and do whatever we wanted. We carried out psychological profiles and biochemical measurements and so on. And we had uh, unexpected, one unexpected finding that was interesting was that ayahuasca in drinkers, as opposed to people that didn't consume it, it persistently upregulated the serotonin transporters. And we thought, this is very interesting. What does this mean? There's a definite biochemical difference between drinkers and non-drinkers. We weren't sure, but then we looked at the literature and it turns out that deficits in these transporters are linked to uh, behavioral uh, dysfunctions such as alcoholism, severe depression, depression with tendency to suicides, this kind of thing. So it appeared that ayahuasca might actually reverse those conditions because most of the people uh, that we interviewed had been fairly dysfunctional when they had joined the church and ended up ayahuasca and the supportive community got them straightened out. Well, from 1990 to 2013 I, was the era where you might say ayahuasca went global uh, and is going global. This is the era we're in now. And uh, a trigger to this was Eduardo Luna's publication of, uh, with Pablo Amaringo, the Peruvian painter of Ayahuasca Visions, uh, which is, was really kind of the first mass marketed book about ayahuasca where people got a feeling of what's going on down there in Peru with these shamans. And from that time, that was published in 1991, and from that time, there's been a slowly building phenomena of ayahuasca tourism, and, and it's the epicenter of that is mostly the Amazonian river town of Iquitos. Uh, and more and more people are coming to Iquitos to experience ayahuasca, and there's also itinerant ayahuasqueros are now coming to the United States on a sort of rock star basis to do tours. There was a landmark conference on ayahuasca at the Cathedral Hotel in San Francisco in 2000. Uh, that was the first conference that I know of that was totally devoted to ayahuasca. And then Alan Shoemaker, who's an expat living in Iquitos, has been organizing the international conferences on shamanism for the last, I think he started in 2005. And uh, that's kept it going and that's elicited a lot more, you know, more interest. Whether it, that's, it's good or bad, I'm not making a judgment here, but it has kept it, uh, you know, sort of in the public spotlight. Another significant uh, development uh, that took place in the 2000s was the Supreme Court's decision. The Uniao do Vegetal, one of the Brazilian churches, uh, was uh, the U.S. government was threatening to prosecute them for using their sacrament and importing it from Brazil. And they fought back and they actually sued the Department of Justice for the right to use ayahuasca uh, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the new court, the new Supreme Court just reconstituted under John Roberts, unanimously 
uh, ruled in their favor. And a few years later, yeah. <laughs> so they can do that. They have the right to do that. If you want to drink ayahuasca legally in this country, you have to join either the UDV or the Santo Daime, which is the other Brazilian branch, and they have secured permission to uh, use ayahuasca in Oregon. Uh, they haven't gone all the way to the Supreme Court. And Roy Haber, uh, the lawyer that was mentioned earlier, was really instrumental in making that happen. And uh, I guess the government basically decided not to press it all the way to the Supreme Court. So there is a measure of protection uh, for people that uh, want to use uh, ayahuasca in a religious context. If you want to use it outside that context or as psychotherapy for other things in a more secular way, you're, you're still not protected. So you, you need to be careful if you're doing this, that's all. Uh, and then, you know, we come to the present. I'm almost done. What's that? Okay. <laughs> This is, the la this is the second to the last slide. <laughs> okay, so we come to the present and uh, talk about landmarks. Uh, I mean, this is a wonderful conference here, but in some ways, I think the MAPS Psychedelic Science 2013 conference is going to be on, no pun intended, many people's MAPS for a long time, because this was the... This was a, an important event. It was kind of a, a milestone in that it let us look at the state uh, that psychedelic science has reached at this point. Uh, it was a very well organized, very well done conference. Thanks to Rick, if he's here, and all his wonderful minions who organized it. Over 2,500 people attended this conference. There were dozens of scientific presentations, posters, workshops on all aspects of psychedelic research. And one of the three main tracks in this, there was clinical, interdisciplinary, and ayahuasca. So ayahuasca had, you know, in a way, it was elevated in status. It's, it's a real object for study, I guess. And so psychedelic science is back. It's not something we have to whisper about. We can be respectable. You can even proclaim that you're a psychedelic researcher and, you know, they won't call the cops or, well, they might, but it depends on who you're talking to. But psychedelic science is real and we're, and the work, I was just totally impressed with the quality of the presentations that were done at this. This is a real thing. And we're finally being able to leverage these tools to, for good, for understanding consciousness and for, as medicines of the spirit. We have a lot more to learn, but that, at last, we can sort of uh, claim leg legitimacy by uh, referring to all this great work that's going on through MAPS, Hefter, groups in the UK, and elsewhere. So uh, this is being done, and uh, uh, it's really encouraging to see. Uh, I'm already uh, over time, so I can't and won't say much about what the future holds, but. I think we have to remember we're part of this ongoing evolutionary process, this, this symbiosis, and we're learning how to integrate this ancient medicine that's literally come out of the Amazon, one of the most threatened spots on the planet in terms of environmental and cultural uh, collapse, uh, to hopefully teach us some some lessons to help wake the monkeys up, if you will. And I think over the next 20 years, we're going to see the fruits of this. I think you're going to see new therapeutic modalities for healing as that potentially have the potential to uh, revolutionize psychiatry and medicine. Uh, we're also learning through our own personal experiences with ayahuasca, we're learning a, a new compassion for each other, a new respect for nature and uh, indigenous wisdom and all life on earth. And this is really the central lesson that we have to learn if we're going to make it through this bottleneck. We have to learn to you know, love nature, love each other and become 
protectors and stewards of nature rather than exploiters of nature. Uh, so hopefully ayahuasca is going to help us learn those things. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. So beautiful and such a nice way to um, close out the presentations for the conference. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank We're going to set up our panel now. I think the, the tables and the mics should be in action.